Hello, and welcome to the eTech Podcast with me, your host, Ryan Morn. I have been involved in the development of electrified vehicles and machines since 2005 as an engineer and a business leader. This podcast is the product of my passion for electric and autonomous vehicle technology. I'm here to share knowledge from some of the world's leading experts, as well as my own insights. Join me as we accelerate the transition to cleaner, safer and smarter vehicles and grow the industry around the world. For today's show, we're back to an interview again. We've got a really interesting interview with Dr. Gregory Offer from Imperial College London. He is the head of the Electrochemical Science and Engineering Group there. And uh, we're going to talk today about some aspects of the research that they're doing, uh, particularly around batteries and battery systems. So welcome to the show, Greg. Thank you. So if we could just make a start, if you could tell us about your sort of personal history and, and how, you, how you came about to be doing what you're doing now. So I trained as a chemist, as an undergraduate at Imperial College London. Um, I then, after graduating the first time around, I actually went and worked as a management consultant for about a year. Uh, it wasn't suited for me and I wasn't suited for it. So after I was um, about to be kicked out by the third partner that I had um, annoyed, I thought I'd best uh, jump before I was pushed. <laughs> so I am... Um, um, you know, I learned a huge, a, a huge amount from that experience, but I also learned that that was not the career I wanted. And my first love, which was science, was I realized what I always wanted to be doing. So I came back to Imperial and did a PhD in electrochemistry um, under Anthony Kusinak, Professor Anthony Kusinak, in actually hydrogen fuel cells. Ah, OK. So kind of... Um... The other other side of the uh, of the coin from uh, from battery systems. Yeah, so at the time they were sort of in at the peak of one of their hype cycles. So you know people hadn't really considered that batteries could be you know had had made enough advances to be used for for commercial electric vehicles yet, um, and everyone was was still pinning their hopes on fuel cells. So this was around about two thousand and two two thousand and three, and you know, I wanted to make a difference with what I was doing. Um, I've always wanted to do that um, ever since a young age. So that's my primary motivation for the research I do. Um, and fuel cells to me at the time seemed to be the best way to make a difference. So, you know, I, I, I learned a lot of electrochemistry, um, you know, did, did a lot of good science, got my PhD. I then actually moved over to engineering. So, you know, at that point, at the end of my PhD, I was looking for what next. And so I moved from low temperature PEM fuel cells actually into high temperature solid oxide fuel cells and did my postdoc under Professor Nigel Brandon. And while I was in engineering, I really discovered, you know, the joy of engineering. You know, I love my chemistry and I love the science. And, and I think it's hugely beneficial that I trained in science first. Yeah. But actually, you know, engineering to me is so much more interesting because you're solving real world problems. And, and now that's that's what really motivates me. And what kind of things were you looking at back then on uh, on fuel cells, if you if you can say? Um, yeah, so it was it was all um, published um, open source. So um, the, it, it, for pan fuel cells, I was studying you know carbon monoxide oxidation on platinum. It's a little bit specific. Okay. Um, most people wouldn't be interested in that. Um, and then actually, there was a theme. I, I sort of moved and studied carbon deposition in solid oxide fuel cells. So it was always studying basically a, a degradation mechanism, you know, understanding how to make them work better in a real world environment when they have to deal with real fuels. Right. So what's led then to the jump across into battery technology? Yeah. So in, in 2009, I, I won a, um, a fellowship. Um, actually, you know, I, I, I won the fellowship around about the same time I ended up sort of working in government for a year. So after three years post docking, I, you know, I, I started, I, I knew I wanted an academic career because um, I've always, always had more ideas than I can answer bouncing around in my head. So I knew I needed a team of people working for me so I could give them all the questions. Right. Um, 
and e even now with a team of about 40 I still don't have enough people for all the questions I've got <laughs> um, but now I, I've got too many people for me to manage so there's sort of a, a, a trade-off a problem there um, but yeah so I was applying for fellowships um, my plan b was to go and work in government so I ended up on secondment in government for a year while I was waiting for the results of all the academic fellowships I'd applied for and then I was successful I got an academic fellowship so I came back full-time to the university and started setting up my research group. The, the fellowship I had was to continue the work in solid oxide fuel cells. But then I very rapidly, literally on my fourth day as a research fellow, ended up putting together a team to put a large proposal together um, where I ended up starting to work on batteries. Um, and this was something called the Future Vehicle Project, which was a sort of, you can imagine it was like a forerunner, a very, very tiny little seed that was one of many seeds that people all over the UK were planting at the time that eventually, you know, um, you know, was one of, like I said, one of many seeds that laid the foundation for what eventually the Faraday Institution would be built upon. Wow. Am I, I'm, am I right in thinking that you don't currently do um, any fuel cell work within the group or is that still uh, an area in which you're active? Yeah, we're, so we're still active in fuel cell research. Um, we, we've sort of, we, we, we kept that alive during the doldrums, sort of the middle of last decade. Um, you know, after the hype cycle in the noughties, last, last decade was pretty dire. Yeah. Um, we, kept it, we kept it going. We sort of managed to get, keep enough funds coming in to keep a core group and sort of maintain that expertise. And actually, you know, so now, now that sort of the, the, the hype seems to be coming back, the good times seem to be coming back. So there are now opportunities for more funding in fuel cells. Yeah. But I'd say it's about it's been about 10, 15 percent of my activity for the last five years. Right. And batteries has been the majority. Oh, I, I tell you what, just a maybe interesting little digression, but that's quite interesting to me that, you know, there's there's like a commonality in skills or in uh, in sort of research overlap there between um, fuel cell technology and battery uh, systems because they're often kind of set off as being kind of opposing kind of competing technologies but there's obviously clearly some overlap in terms of the the, the research work yeah i mean i actually you know they're, they're very synergistic i mean the two technologies essentially go well together and in in one way they sort of they compete for the imagination of what should come next mm. in terms of passenger electric vehicles um, but actually in reality they don't compete with each other for, from a systems engineering point of view because a battery is an energy storage device and a fuel cell is an energy conversion device mm. and the storage is is the fuel in a tank yeah so they they don't meet the same you know use require use pattern requirement for the technology for the sorry for the application so you know, if you want a long distance vehicle and you don't need much, you don't need high power, then a fuel cell is always going to be the best. But if you want, you know, high power and you don't need much energy, short distances or, you know, what's actually been, you know, what Tesla came along and showed was really possible is that you can put a lot of, you know, the energy density doesn't matter um, or the gravimetric energy density doesn't matter. You know, a heavy car isn't a problem. Um, so you can have lots of batteries. You can have a long range. Um, obviously now we've, you know, the recharging times can be a challenge at times, but I actually, I wrote a paper, which was until a few years ago, my most highly cited paper and probably my least scientific paper, um, <laughs> back in 2010, which was, um, comparing, you know, battery, electric, hydrogen, fuel cell, and hybrid vehicles, you know, and trying to say, you know, which is the best. And actually it came to the conclusion that, you know, a fuel cell plug-in hybrid is technologically the, the best option, um. I think I think our approach was a bit naive at the time. It was a techno-economic analysis, and I think what the industry has shown over the last decade is actually simplification is is really valuable. And mm. battery electric vehicles are so simple in comparison to a fuel cell vehicle, and that actually you know you, you don't want to go for a hybrid because yeah. you just go for a straight battery electric vehicle. It might not be perfect, but it's so simple and easy to make that you know it. It, it, it beats the fuel cell systems because fuel cell systems do tend to be quite complicated. Yeah, that is, it is yeah, that systems, uh, system level complexity adds a lot of sort of platform engineering cost and uh, and, and component cost to the the uh, the vehicle. You got to really want the extra benefit that you can get with a with a fuel cell system. Yeah, so as, I mean, we see fuel cells as being very very big in certain niches. You know, so if you have, you know, 
uh, clearly, you know, buses in city centres, battery, you know, batteries have wiped the floor. But if you're going to want, you know, coaches, long distance vehicles, you know, heavy goods vehicles, shipping, you know, there's there's a lot of niches where fuel cells make sense. In fact, the first vehicle that fuel cells were properly commercialised in was forklift trucks for distribution warehouses, and the technology they were just dis- displacing was battery electric forklift trucks. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. It's interesting, interesting that uh, that that kind of um, the the comparison and and the overlap between them, and actually thinking sensibly about how you can use the two to complement in different use cases. Um, oh, thank you, thanks for that. So, actually, the main purpose of the discussion today, um, we we'll get into the in, into the main meat of the topic, is around the work that you guys are doing in um, in battery uh, research and development. So. Could you just um, give us an overview of, of the kind of activities that you're doing in, in battery development? Yeah, I mean, so it, it all started from when um, when I got my fellowship at the very start and sort of in, uh, I sort of briefly mentioned the Future Vehicle Project. And then also you know, in year two of my fellowship, I had the opportunity to apply for a sort of a new direction funding, which the EPSSC had at the time for fellows. And you know, so that you could add another research topic to your fellowship to explore something new. And, and I applied to to work on batteries. And it sort of it, it, all of our work on thermal management sort of stemmed from the germ of an idea that that I had, or we had at that time, which was that we wanted to be able to recreate experimentally in the lab, thermal boundary conditions around a single cell, that it might experience anywhere inside a battery pack. So that we basically wanted to be, you know, we, we didn't want to have to make an entire battery pack in order to be able to explore surface cooling or tab cooling or immersion cooling, et cetera. So we set ourselves the challenge of recreating this experimentally. It's quite, quite difficult, quite challenging. You know, we, so we therefore, we pioneered the use of Peltier elements, thermoelectric generators to, can, you know, to manage you know, to maintain boundary conditions under constant conditions. So using the Peltier elements, we could keep surface temperatures constant, or we could maintain conditions of constant heat flux, or or, or any other, you know, uh, combination. We, we, we could, um, you know, we, we, we could make the surface temperature of the cell match the rate at which the cell it was heating itself up constantly as well. Right. So we could, we could basically create experimentally what you can set in a model really easily you know you can set no heat flux in a model really easily to achieve that experimentally extremely difficult and so on and so forth so we started pioneering the development of this unique at the time experimental capability you know since then subsequently other people have sort of like copied it or or generated developed their own methods using different approaches um and and we've just continually kept using that and so we we started to use that to both study the impact of thermal gradients on the performance of batteries yeah. and then you know and then the uh, impact of different th- you know of thermal gradients on the long term degradation of batteries and particularly the impact of which surface do you cool and how that affects a battery's behavior and how it degrades over time and and when you say thermal gradients are you talking about sort of pack level um, thermal gradient or a uh, cell level what what kind of um, what... so uh, strangely enough, we don't actually we we don't actually see that there's any difference between those two. Okay. Um, because it, a cell, unless you have a single layer pouch cell, a cell is already you know a multi-layer pouch cell or a wound cylindrical cell is already a battery pack. Yeah. You know, each layer within a pouch cell is is it in itself an individual cell, and then each multiple layer is connected within the pouch in parallel electrically but thermally in series if you're doing surface cooling and so we see exactly the same effects within cells with between the layers within cells as you would see between cells in a battery pack um, if you have thermal gradients between cells in a battery pack okay and what is the um you know what what is it you're sort of looking for with the thermal gradient what what are the issues that that causes or, or the, I don't know, the benefits it can bring or what, what's the kind of, what are you trying to dig into there? Well, I mean, ultimately you can't make a battery pack if you don't have a cooling system. Hmm. Um, you know, you, you either, you know, have one by accident, 
because how you know you haven't thought about it and you design a battery pack and the heat has to get out somehow um or you make certain design choices and you and you and you allow the heat to uh exit via certain paths or or you deliberately move the heat around using a fluid of some kind so air or or, or water or a dielectric fluid or something so you've always got to have this and you're always going to have thermal gradients inside batteries so the next question is what's the consequence of those thermal gradients and it all comes down to you know actually the physics inside you know the chemistry mm-hmm. and what's going on and the fact that there are chemical reactions going on and chemical reactions typically have have you know their rate the rate of reaction typically has an arrhenius relationship with temperature so it means that the the rate of reaction gets easier exp- you know exponentially as the temperature increases right. so what this means is that if you have a thermal gradient inside a cell then the hot layers at the beginning of a discharge or a charge the hot you know the cell is uniform in temperature you start generating heat because you're passing current or you're generating current um, and of course the heat near the outside can get out more easily so the heat in the middle accumulates and the inside starts getting hot now the layers or the regions that are in the middle where it's hottest now the reactions are faster they're sort of easier so you, they start to generate more current than the colder regions near the outside and what that means is if you're discharging the battery well then those middle regions will discharge quicker mm. so you end up with current in homogeneities and state of charge in homogeneities caused by this thermal in homogeneity and there is a positive feedback mechanism where you know they accelerate each other and the long term consequence is that if you've got higher currents than the average then you know we we already know from other work that higher currents typically lead to higher rates of degradation so you then have this additional positive feedback that causes accelerated degradation right and i i think a lot of people would be aware that the sort of bulk temperature of a battery pack was an important characteristic you know we always kind of know that batteries don't like getting too hot on average or being too cold on average and there's kind of like a, a bulk temperature consideration there but it's interesting that um actually the distribution of the heat within the pack um has such a big a uh, big impact, but the way the way you explain it, it seems obvious. <laughs> like, of course, of course. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> I, I I think I think that was why the you know the the 2016 paper we published, which was sort of like seminal for us, um, proving empirically, you know, a, a, an experiment where we cycled two cells in different ways. You know, a thousand, we cycled them a thousand times. One was surface cooled, one tab cooled, and we showed that the tab cooled cell was at a higher average temperature but had a lower thermal gradient mm. and degraded slower than the surface cooled cell which had a lower average temperature and so this was you know flew in the face of conventional wisdom exactly what you said that you know you know th- there's a sweet spot you can if you go really cold it starts to age because of lithium plating but if you go really hot you know generally speaking the hotter it is the faster it degrades and we so we had an empirical result where a cell that was hotter had aged slower than the cell that was cooler. And this was purely due to the thermal gradients. So, you know, the explanation, when we offered it to the community, everyone was just like, oh yeah, that's kind of obvious. But sometimes it's 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 like um, the, the quiz show, who wants to be a millionaire? You know, the, the answer is obvious if you know it. <laughs> and when someone points it out to you, it's obvious. But sometimes the the, the step changes in understanding are just something so simple, a question so simple that it, it takes a lot of, you know, it takes a long time until someone realizes that you should be ask, asking that question. And I guess the, the kind of feed in um, challenge there is that in, it's still, in, in fact, even now it's still quite common to have um, surface cooling, like that probably one of the more common methods to cool. Um, I think some, some of the high volume vehicles that were using interleaf, um, cooling plates have stopped now, but it 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 certainly was something that you're seeing a lot of uh, people really concentrating on the bulk cooling of the pack um, without really paying much attention to uh, the temperature gradients they were generating in the cells. Yeah, and I I'd, I'd I'd say that the majority of engineering companies, the majority of battery packs that that I've looked at, you know, um, they they have unfortunately 
been forced into making that decision. So they, in many cases, they have made the right decision to choose surface cooling for that cell. And so what our latest research, um, you know, we, we've sort of, we've been trying to unpack and understand, you know, why the industry is in the state it's in, how it got there and how to, you know, take it down a different path because essentially to you know to, to to leapfrog to the conclusion because otherwise it'll be a very very long explanation of, of unnecessary um the, the sort of I, I could go into the journey of discovery <laughs> we've had over the last four years but there's a lot of detail there so to jump to the conclusion we we, we realized that the entire lithium-ion battery industry has fallen into um what elon musk would call the subsystem optimization trap mm. so the cell manufacturers tend to design the cell and they don't, on the whole, um, tend to consider ev- you know, all of the consequences of their cell design decisions at the system level. And then the system designers have to design a system around whatever cells they can get their hands on. Um, and the cell manufacturers are sort of in a uniquely powerful position that it's sort of like a supplier's market. Um, so you know, in the automotive industry, at least, you know, that that they they can they, they can sell the cells they design. So why should they redesign them? Um, and also the, the, you know, people buy a cell typically initially based upon the spec sheet and there's sort of a race for high energy densities. Yeah. Um, so the cell manufacturers are trying to pack as much energy into a specific volume and mass as they can. And in order to do that, they, they want to get rid of as much of the parasitic mass as possible. Yeah. And a lot of that parasitic mass is useful for thermal management. <laughs> yeah. So what they've ended up doing is designing cells that are really, really badly designed for tab cooling. Um, so over the last year or two, we've developed something that we call the cell cooling coefficient, which we, we came to the conclusion, well, if, if the industry has fallen into this trap because they sell cells based upon energy density, and that's what you put on the spec sheet, there's no information on a typical spec sheet that tells you how easy it is to thermally manage that cell. Mm. And so we, we've come up with the cell cooling coefficient as a, again, an empirically measurable. So you don't need to know anything about the cell. It's chemistry independent, form factor independent. You just need to get your hands on a cell. And as long as you can test it, the equipment you, you need is really simple and easy to design. It's nothing, you know, it's not rocket science. Mm. Um, it's just 1D heat transfer. Um, and we can measure essentially in units of watts per Kelvin, how many watts of heat can we get out of a cell for every Kelvin of temperature difference between the cell and the cooling fluid um, or the cooling boundary. Um, So typically that's the hottest point of the cell to the coldest point of the cell. So, you know, for two degrees temperature difference, you might be able to get one watt out. So we would say that that's 0.5 watts per Kelvin. Um, And the, the cell cooling coefficient, a cell will normally have multiple cell cooling coefficients, one for each surface. Mm. So, you know, if you if the tab cooling coefficient will be different from the surface cooling coefficient. We look at typical cells um, that are available for electric vehicles and the ratio between the, you know, the surface to tab cooling coefficients tends to be 10, 20, in some cases, even 40 to one. So you can pull out 20 times as much heat from the surfaces as you can from the tabs. Now, the original study that we did four years ago, tab versus surface cooling, you know, we deliberately picked the best cell we could find, which had a ratio of about three to one. So it was like the the tabs were pretty good for getting heat out. And that would mean by good, they would be sort of have a large thermal mass, fairly chunky bits of metal. Basically, it was a small cell with big tabs at either end. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, whereas, you know, the type of cells that electric vehicles normally use is either a massive big prismatic cell or a large form factor cell. Mm. You know, cylindrical cells are a bit different. Cylindrical cells, there's some quite unique um, features there. And actually, some of Tesla's recent announcements are super interesting. Mm. Um, you know, we're about to publish a paper on on cylindrical cells, thermal management, which, um, you know, suggests that some of the redesign features that Tesla have done for their cylindrical cells are a very, very good idea. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I, I've got some questions on cylindricals. Um, we, we, we come to that uh, in, uh, well, hopefully in a minute or two. Um, 
So in, in, in terms of that, with the, the difference on the cell cooling coefficient, you've obviously kind of looked at that on a lot of different cells now. Um, and there's, there's sort of the clearly, you've got to two different styles. You've got the kind of energy type cells and you've got power type cells. And I think, you know, the energy ones, it's, it's completely, I hear what you're saying. They've been optimized within an inch of their life, trying to get as much active material in there as possible but often that means taking out um thermal mass or, or certainly making them more sensitive it's more sensitive to bulk temperature um it, on the energy cells so you have to be careful with them from a power point of view and a current point of view but would you say within those kind of different classifications is there is there still a big variation cell to cell in terms of their uh, thermal performance uh yes very much so so what we're looking to do, and we're really at the early days, is we'd, you know, we'd love the opportunity to test as many cells as we could get our hands on mm. and have the freedom to publish the cell cooling coefficients. Um, because I think if, 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 if the community had the ability to compare cells from different manufacturers, you, know, you could begin to see whose cells were good and whose cells were bad. Mm. And that would trigger behavioral change, you know, because that would trigger a response. You know, the, 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 the companies who make bad cells from a thermal measurement point of view, hopefully would start to lose customers. And therefore that would trigger them to think, oh, maybe we should redesign our cells. And that would then trigger the, you know, the change in the entire industry that we, you know, we think is necessary for the long term um, future of electric vehicles. Yeah, because it's such a big topic. The uh, thermal management, you know, we, we, we're touching on, not only the life of the battery pack, so the degradation uh, characteristics that you talked about, but then also the, the parasitic power consumption of the thermal management system, which is probably the biggest, um, par well, certainly the biggest parasitic load um, and one of the biggest loads on the vehicle, you know, on top of the traction system. So the overall efficiency of the vehicle is impacted in such a big way by the, um, the thermal performance. And, the the degradation characteristics then drive other things like you know we've seen a lot of um, the new evs coming on the market with incredibly safe let's say um parameters for battery usable capacity you know and, and presumably well not that has been done because of uh, trying to kind of maximize the the life cycle and the kind of performance uh, consistency of the pack um, but at a sacrifice of, of actual usable capacity on the vehicle. So the kind of it sounds like quite a small uh, thing, but then when you start to really think about how it impacts a vehicle, it's, it's such a fundamental thing in terms of a, a battery electric vehicle design. Getting the thermal performance right at a cell level can totally transform the, the whole vehicle. Yeah, there's so many uh, I, I, detrimental positive feedback loops uh all of the ones you just described you know if you you know the, that if you can unpack it if you can if you can reverse the the you know the, the path that the industry is currently going down you know if you can redesign the cell you might lose you know we, we've got a paper where we did a virtual redesign of um you know the the, the cell that goes in the renault zoe yeah. and we showed that you know by playing around with the tabs and the thickness and the width and etc we you know we could achieve tab cooling rates comparable to surface cooling rates, you know, and so if you can, if you could, but you, you know, but in order to do that, we would lose a few percent of, you know, energy density at the cell level, you know, and that's obviously why the manufacturers have done the opposite. They've, yeah. they've done the opposite of what we would do to get a few extra percent of energy density at the cell level. But, you know, we would say, well, lose that, those few extra percent of energy density at the cell level then you've got a cell that the thermal gradients within the cell are going to be much smaller, which actually means the usable capacity, which is what the, the frankly, the only thing you should care about, not the spec sheet capacity, but the usable capacity will actually probably go up. Yeah. And you'll have a higher voltage because your losses will be lower because the cell will operate more efficiently. So your usable energy, um, not just capacity will be, you know, uh, you, you get a double benefit both in the extra capacity and the extra voltage yeah. you then have less heat to reject so your thermal management system can be simpler cheaper probably you know uh, way less take up less volume 
you then also have cells that will probably last longer yeah because you can thermally manage them within a tighter window and you've got less thermal gradients and we know that that is an you know a multiplier to the degradation on top of just the raw t- the raw average temperature yeah. so every you know almost every way we look at this we sort of come to the conclusion that apart from the the the, the sunk you know apart from the cost of the cell redesign and the fact you might need to retool some manufacturing lines or have a you know apart from the upfront investment in a new cell but it's only the sort of the mechanical design of the cell mm-hmm. um everything else is kind of just like a win 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 yeah. <laughs> so, and just and just to be clear because we we talk about kind of packaging form factors uh in a minute but the we're talking about the difference between you know that you'd look at with on the bench one pouch cell to another that are sort of similar looking but have a huge difference in terms of their performance or so one cylindrical cell to another where there's such a huge difference at the cell level performance on these things so it's not we're not talking about you know some horrible big uh, plastic packaged prismatic versus an elegant little pouch cell it, it's actually there are huge differences that you found at a at a cell level on you know apparently similar packaging form factors is that right? It, it it doesn't take much. I mean, so so I mean, we we sort of did a, a toy problem in 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 one of our papers on the cell cooling coefficient. So we had two cells, uh, and we said, okay, you know, here's an imaginary application where you need to, you know, have a 15 amp hour battery pack. You can achieve it with three five amp hour cells or two seven and a half amp hour cells. You know, the the five amp hour cell might have a tab cooling coefficient of 0.3. And the 7.5 amp cell might have a tab cooling coefficient of 0.2. You know, they don't sound that different. Yeah. But you know, the for the for the five amp cell, you'd need three of them. For the 7.5 amp cell, you'd need two of them to give you 15 amperes. The other really important thing that I haven't mentioned you need to know is you need to know the heat generation. Mm. And you you mentioned earlier, sort of like uh, you mentioned briefly, sort of like you talked about energy cells and also power cells. Yeah. And actually, so you know an energy cell might have quite a large heat generation rate, whereas a power cell typically will have a much lower heat generation rate. So you really need to know the heat generation rates to be able to calculate, you know, it's a combination of the heat generation and the cell cooling coefficient that will tell you how hot the cell will get. So you need to be able to map the heat generation for your sort of application. So you sort of need to know sort of the, the cell behavior the application specific and then the cell cell cooling coefficient. The cell cooling coefficient is the only constant. Right. The heat generation rate is a function of how you use the cell. Um, but in this hypothetical application, you know, the heat generation in the five amp cell was about five watts. You know, we measured it. These are real cells. We, we measured the cell cooling coefficients. We measured the heat generation rates. The heat generation rates in the 7.5 amp cell was eight watts. So again, right. five watts, eight watts, cooling coefficient of 0.3, 0.2, not big differences, but you add it together into the pack, you know, you divide the heat generation and the cell cooling coefficient over each other, and you add in that you've got three cells, not two, the difference in temperature between the cooling fluid and the five amp hour cell was 15 degrees, you know, which is, you know, not, not great from a systems engineering point of view, but you could do it. Yeah. You know, if you wanted to hold the cell at 25 degrees, your cooling fluid would need to be at 10. For the seven and a half amp cell the difference in temperature would need to be 40 degrees wow which is you know Huge. it's a non, non-starter if you <laughs> want to hold a cell at 25 degrees you need cooling fluid at minus 15 yeah you know to pull out that much heat you need a 40 degree temperature gradient to pull out you know eight watts so you know th- this these simple numbers that you know you just measure them they, they might only be you know 30 percent different but when you start adding them, multiplying them together, it can, you know, it, it's, it, it gives the engineers a tool at the beginning before they even do any pack design and spend hardly any, you know, they can spend hardly any money. If these numbers were on spec sheet of a cell, yeah. you could choose the best cell for your pack at right at the beginning at almost minimal cost. Whereas at the moment, you almost have to design the battery pack and do full simulations before you can, un- before you can realize you picked the wrong cell. Yeah, and that's a huge. I mean, we we are seeing people putting inordinate amounts of effort into designing very very complex thermal management systems in in inside packs now. You know, some very complicated um, cooling um, surfaces and uh, and channels and and fluid pathways and 
even uh, two-phase cooling and, you know, hu- huge amount of complexity going into that. And you do wonder if maybe if it was just a kind of solved at, with a better cell specification up front, you, you could actually get rid of quite a lot of that. Basically, it, make, it, it almost makes me cry because we, we as an industry should not be having to do this. It's yeah. unnecessary. We, we just need better cells. And it does. I mean, you mentioned Tesla earlier, but when you look at the cooling uh, sort of channels in, I mean, you couldn't really get much simpler than um, than the, either the Model 3 or the Model S, the very, very simple kind of um, cooling uh, pathways in, in the pack. Um, and it just seems to be uh, at the opposite end of the spectrum to what some other manufacturers are doing with much, much more complex systems. Yeah, and I think the most recent Tesla patent that came out um, for the sort of the, the cylindrical cell that they've redesigned so that instead of just having sort of one tab for the jelly roll welded to the top and the bottom, they, you know, as far as I can work out, they sort of just extended all of the current collectors up and just mashed them together and welded them to the top and the bottom. Um, and interestingly enough, that's how supercapacitors are made. Mm. And Tesla bought Maxwell about a year ago. Yeah. So this is obviously one of the technologies they realized that they could transfer from how supercaps are made and make cylindrical lithium ion batteries better. Yeah. And the consequence that has on that cell, you know, means that, you know, those cells generate a lot less heat mm. and you can get the heat out far more easily. So it, it is it's probably one of the most significant advances um, from Tesla that, that I've seen. You know, whereas most other people might just look at that and go, oh, that's just a trivial change. Yeah. But in my opinion, that's probably the most significant change they've made. And that's um, I'll, I'll put a link to that um, that patent because I was I was reading that not that long ago. And, th- and there are there's a number of sort of features in there which are fairly simple, like small sort of geometry type things. And it doesn't seem like much, but then actually it's like, yeah, can kind of see but, what you know, the there. best the best engineering is simple changes that are elegant yeah. you know the, the the best engineering is is you know the the the, the engineering designs that stand the, the test of time are the simplest yeah definitely um and actually so so I, I mentioned a couple of times the the cell form factor so this is an interesting topic and we've just been talking about tesla and they've obviously they've they've really concentrated on the cylindricals although Recently, there have some interesting comments. Uh, Elon Musk saying that we only use cylindricals because that's what we had at the time, um, and if we, you know, could go back, we might not do the same again. And they've started talking about, uh, what well, not even talking about. It. So they're going to have um, some different form factor cells in Chinese market cars. And there's been this big debate in the industry about what's the best form factor. Is it the uh, cylindrical cell? Um, and the, the proponents of that tend to talk about the sort of volume manufacturing cost. Um, is it the, the pouch cell? And people tend to talk about volumetric energy density and improved cooling there. Um, so what's what's your kind of um, take? And, and then, well, so I, f- I forgot to mention prismatic, so it's pretty <laughs> big, uh, big class. And that's that's probably what Tesla are going to have in uh, the new Chinese cars um, and actually completely different LFP, sort of relatively low energy density um, cell in a pr- prismatic format. So really, almost going back to that's how that's how people were building EVs twenty years ago with um, big uh, prismatic LFP cells. Yeah, I mean, well, n- uh, not not just big prismatic, but really big as yeah. the, from from what I hear, sort of the the, the blade, mm. the, the cattle blade battery. Are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is, as uh, I think, from some of the cattle patents, um, you know, appears to be the width of the entire vehicle, yeah, as a single prismatic cell. Um, now, of course, from a packaging point of view, you can look at that and you think, well, that's really simple and easy to package. You know, you just have a, a row of these things and you just bolt them together down the sides and job done. You've got a battery pack. Yeah. Um, so I can I can see the attractiveness of it absolutely. Um, What I haven't been able to find out is how it's thermally managed. Mm. And I fear that now, now Tesla's, you know, the, the, the model S battery, you know, the original Tesla battery pack, I think was very, very well engineered in that no one bit of the system was over engineered compared to the others. Mm. And I think that's what engine, that's what Tesla have always done really well. You know, a lot of people have criticized them and said, you know, nothing is super advanced. Well, 
frankly, it, it doesn't need to be. You know, if all the individual bits, you know, none of none of the subsystems are over optimized, then you've got something that can be made, you know, yeah. at volume and and cheaply and etc. And that's what they've always done well. So I think this 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 pack they've made uh, by the looks of it in partnership with Cattle, you know, probably fulfills that those criteria in that it will be super cheap and easy to make. Yeah. Um, but I fear that it 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 won't be very easy to thermally manage. Yeah, um, it's going to be a lower performance pack for sure. It'd be, it'd be interesting. I know one of the, I don't know, it's the sort of not so nice things about Tesla packs. And, and, and even from a manufacturing point of view, at a pack level, one of the things they have big challenges with is the amount of kind of liquid adhesives and thermal resins and pastes and stuff that go into building the the pack there's there's quite a lot to that to kind of gluing all the cylindricals together and making sure they've got good thermal connection to the cooling um so from that point of view handling uh, prismatics and assembling a pack is going to be a much simpler uh, thing to do so long as you can put the, a cooling system on it in a in an appropriate place yeah absolutely so i mean uh, like i said i haven't been able to find out enough information you know on on how they're thermally managing you know for that particular pack design so you know i, I don't want to criticize it i i just say i don't know and i fear that yeah. they, they 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 may not you know that they they may not have a cell design that's very easily easy to thermally manage yeah i mean we've done we've we've done quite a few projects looking at thermal interface materials you know you know we can measure the cell cooling coefficient that's the outside of the cell well how do you get the heat from the outside of the cell into your cooling fluid? Yeah. And there's lots of different ways of achieving that. So we also have, you know, something we call the system cooling coefficient, which is, you know, we, we can, uh, again, a single metric that we can compare the performance of the entire thermal management system. Um, you know, we it's, it, it's, again, it's super simple. It's how much heat are you rejecting and what's the, the, the largest thermal gradient? You know, what's the hottest point of the hottest cell? and the coldest point of your cooling system um and what's the total amount of heat you're rejecting and you can calculate your system cooling coefficient and it's a really really simple way of comparing different different people's um thermal management designs yeah. and and you'll find you know um significant variations yeah how, how do you think the different form factors measure up against each other you know if, if you were looking at cylindrical or prismatic or pouch cell, what do you think the kind of strengths and weaknesses of the different um, form factors are? Um, I kind of flip flop and keep changing my mind <laughs> because as, as, as things change, you know, as, as a scientist, I'm trained to, um, frankly, um, do U-turns all the time when, yeah. when new evidence comes along. Um, which, which always amuses me when people think that changing your mind is a bad thing. And it's from a scientist, it's essential. It's called um, learning. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, it's called learning. Um, and, and somebody won't change their mind and won't perform a U-turn when new evidence is is then negligent, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, but that, that rant over. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think prismatic cells, large form factor prismatic cells in a can, the way that they're currently designed, and so this is a criticism of how they're currently designed are some of the worst. Right. Their cell cooling coefficients are amongst some of the lowest that we've measured. Um, and this is normally because you've got about, you know, you've got large, very, you know, you've maybe got 90 amp hours or 100 amp hours in a rectangular block that's surrounded by plastic or metal, and it's not optimized for getting heat out. Mm. So you've got a large amount of heat generation and not, not it's not very easy to get it out. Now, we, we, we've, you know we in our models we we can imagine or we've shown that there are ways you can redesign prismatics and and get their cell cooling coefficients up by significant amounts you know so they're not inherently a bad form factor it's just yeah. the, the way they're currently designed um you know they're, they're not designed well for for thermal management yeah. but they do have other advantages i mean so cylindrical cells and prismatic cells have the advantage if they're in a can which does inherently mean that it's easier to make them safe Mm. um than than a pouch cell where you have to think about well i could get propagation quite easily i've therefore got to either isolate them within the pack or, or do something about that yeah. so and, you know cylindrical cells are really nice because those cans you know the unit of energy in each can is really small so if you can prevent propagation from one 
little can to another, then the amount of energy that will go off, that, that will be released if one cell in a Tesla battery pack or, or, or anyone else who uses cylindrical cells, um, you know, is, is small and can be absorbed by the thermal mass of the pack. So, you know, whereas, you know, and then the advantage of a pouch cell is that inherently they should enable you to achieve the very, very highest energy density at the pack level because they've got the least parasitic mass, you know, they've got no can around them basically. Yeah. Um, so it really depends upon the application, but in terms of measurable cell cooling coefficients, um, at the moment, the way they're currently designed, prismatic cells are at the bottom, cylindrical cells in the middle, pouch cells at the top. Right. Uh, but, you know, I haven't got my hands on Tesla's new cell yet. And that cylindrical cell, I would predict, would have, you know, would probably be quite good yeah. from a thermal measurement point of view. And like I said, we're just, you know, we're just doing some work now where we're showing that you can redesign prismatics to get their cell cooling coefficients much higher if you wanted to. Mm. That's interesting because at a... It's such a complex, um, in, I mean, we talked earlier about how battery electric is simple, and it, and it is, but <laughs> it's also very, it's simple but complex. Within a battery pack, it's it, in terms of, if if we were happy with the cost, uh, you know, there was no cost kind of uh, constraints, money was no object, it, it would be really simple. But actually, because we're constantly trying to get the cost down, the sort of performance efficiency of the packs up, um, there's a, there's a real kind of push to Im- improve um, Im- improve the packs, and every little aspect has a knock on effect. You know the the way that so cylindrical has some advantages, but then some other big disadvantages in terms of the small is good in some ways, but then bad in others because you've got to handle lots of them, and the and the manufacturing cost of a cylindrical can be very low because of its continuous process, and like the pouch cells where you're having to kind of stack. And it's it's a inherently just a slower process. But then you look at a prismatic; couldn't be easier to package it up. So <laughs> the kind of production, yeah. a, a, so many moving parts in terms of trying to optimize it and get it right. Yeah, and I think I think you know I would draw parallels with the internal combustion engine a hundred years ago, and you know think you know I'm not an expert in the internal combustion engine. Um, uh, I've never been interested in them, quite frankly. Um, but um, you know, but I, you know, the little I do know is that there's lots and lots of different types of engines, and yet, you know, how many of them succeeded? Yeah. You know, a small subset of them became, you know, you 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 ended up with sort of like the the dominant petrol engine and the diesel engine. Yeah. And you know, yes, they've advanced over time, and and the engines that we have now, you, you know, would not be recognisable. To, to people were you know from 50 years ago but you know battery packs you know will we end you know we ended up with sort of petrol and diesel we ended up with two engines at the moment we've sort of got three main form factors for batteries will we still have three in 20 years time quite possibly because like you said they they each have a different different sort of advantage disadvantage combination yeah. um, we might see some rationalization you know we might drop it down to two but i doubt we'll ever have a single cell design and a single type of battery pack design for every application because there's just too much variation in in what applications need you know there's orders of magnitude difference between you know what an electric vehicle with a long range needs to do where you know at worst you might be discharging at 0.2 or 0.3 c yeah. You know, fast charging is actually the challenge. That's when you really aggressively push the system versus a, you know, a, a micro hybrid where you might be doing 30 C. Yeah. Um, you know, it's an order of magnitude difference. You're absolutely not going to have the same cell for both, uh, both applications. You know, and then there's even more crazily aggressive applications at either end of that as well. So, you know, there's, there's orders of magnitude difference in how batteries will be used. Therefore, there will always be a place for different cell designs and different battery pack designs moving forward. Yeah, yeah, wow. So, so now the kind of obviously the, the, the team has grown. The kind of work areas have grown at, at um, Imperial. Um, I think you mentioned earlier you've got uh, over forty people now in the in the depart in your group. Uh, in 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 our department. So so our group is bigger. There's you know it's it's total of about eighty people across four departments. Right. Um, so in the mechenge part, which I manage, is about about forty right. at the moment. Um, 
so yeah but that's not just me there, there are yeah. you know there's there's more than one academic in in our bit of the group so there's myself monica um yatish and Huija. so yeah i i could not supervise that many people on my own as a lot of clever people to have uh, in, uh, in in one place and you, and you you're presumably working on a huge huge range of different projects for different kinds of uh organizations and uh, sort of industrial partners and, and academic research what what are your kind of main research areas at the moment what's what sort of work are you doing for people um so yeah it's um you know it's a, a lot of it is around innovate uk projects so i'd say the the core of the group is innovate uk projects where we work with industry yeah um i also um, manage the multi-scale modeling project on behalf of the faraday institution so that's another big project where you know that's involving other universities. So that's a consortium of nine universities in the UK. Um, but the industry partners is a, a lot of it is around. You know what we try and do when we're working with industry partners is develop the knowledge that they need to solve engineering problems. Um, you know because the industry partners will often want to own the engineering solution themselves. So so a lot of our projects are on thermal management, and a lot of the work we do is on developing underpinning knowledge. So the yeah. kind of ideal projects for us is where an industry partner is trying to solve a problem. And, you know, no matter how good they are as an engineer, they, they can't solve the problem because of a lack of knowledge. And then that's the ideal point for us to come in because we love generating new knowledge. You know, we are a fundamental research group. We do, we do the science, yeah. but all of the science we do is ultimately with an engineering application in mind. So there's always someone waiting for the answer who, as soon as they get the answer, it's going to help them improve their products, develop new services, new products, et cetera. So, um, yeah, that's why, you know, I, I built my group on Innovate UK projects working with industry. It's the main reason I moved from science to engineering. Um, it's basically just because I love solving real world problems. Mm. That is my, my favorite definition of, uh, engineering. I used to uh, know a guy, um, and he always used to say, uh, engineering is the application of knowledge to solve problems. It was yeah. uh, simple as that. Totally agree. Yeah. So to do that, you've got to have the knowledge and you've got to be able to solve problems. So it's in a good spot. And what's kind of coming um, for you as a department or what do you see in the industry that's coming that's got you excited um, in terms of future trends? Um, oh, I suppose we, we're always keeping an eye on what's coming. I mean... The, you know, new chemistries, um, we've, we've done quite a bit of work on lithium sulfur over the years and that those activities are scaling up. That's quite an interesting technology. Um, solid state batteries, we've been working on them for, you know, sort of about the last four years, the first two years sort of under the radar. Then obviously, you know, it takes time for work to mature and for you to publish. Then, then yeah. we've sort of had a few papers over the last couple of years. And of course the work has been growing, so more papers will be coming. Yeah. Um, so what we're always trying to do is we're trying to anticipate the problems that industry will face before they face them mm. so that we're ready so that when they come to us with sort of panicky questions of like, oh, we need help with this. We'll be like, oh, well, we might have something that can help you. Yeah. <laughs> so beginning to understand how these changes to the way that cells are made, both from a materials point of view, will affect, you know, how they behave at a system level. Um, you know, means that first we need to get our hands on them, test them, and then we need to, you know, understand whether the physics is the same and we can just reparameterize our models or whether there's new and different physics, which means that we need to change our models. Um, so, yeah, that's that, that's the stuff that we're sort of always working on, sort of like trying to keep ahead of the game and, and be ready for when new things come. Oh, fantastic. So I, I think uh, I've noticed the time there and... We've uh, we have managed to, as usual, uh, blow the time budget. So I apologise for that. Um, thank you so much for giving me um, giving me your time this afternoon to to talk about this. It's been um, it's been really interesting. I've I've learned a lot, and I, and I hope the the listeners have got a lot out of that. So thanks thanks for taking the time out to join us today, Greg. Been a pleasure, Ryan. Thank you for taking the time out to listen to the podcast today. I hope you found that as uh, interesting as useful as I did. I've known Greg for a while, but we've never really gone into sort of that much depth in terms of the research topics and the areas that he's working on. And wow, uh, absolutely fascinating stuff. So like I said, I'll put some links in the show notes to Greg and his research group and some of the other things that we mentioned. Um, so you go down to the show notes and have a look at those. Um, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Uh, leave us a rating uh, or a comment. 
or hit like, depending on which platform you're listening to us on. It really helps. It helps get the show up there um, and, uh, and and raise its profile so more people get to find it. Um, so I really appreciate everyone who's been doing that for us. That's It's absolutely fantastic. We've got some really good episodes coming, some fantastic interviews and some more of our sort of back to basics, um, original format uh, question shows. So uh, lots, lots more coming. Uh, and I really look forward to speaking to you again soon.